Hi, good evening. Good evening, Lore Leonardo. <laughs> good evening, Maestra. Um, well, my name is Leonardo Pineda. I'm the director of youth music education for the orchestra. Um, now, I want to uh, thank and welcome all of you for joining us tonight for this pre-concert talk as we prepare for our coming live streaming on the 10th. Um, I want to tell you that these pre-concert talks are a space to get familiarized with the music we're doing for the concerts, but it's also an opportunity um, for all of us to ask questions to our performers, uh, to our conductors, and to our composers when possible. Uh, we're so honored to have Tania Leon with us tonight for a conversation led with um, by Sebastian Danila, a word music researcher and part of the artistic staff for the orchestra now, um, and, and joined by our first year bassoonist, um, Cheryl Fries, who is going, going to be sharing um, her experience playing in the orchestra, and Nicole, who is our um, director of development, and I will be um, reading the questions. Um, so I want to encourage all of you um, to type questions as we go in the conversation in the Q&A section, so we can um, address them at the end. Um, so I want to pass it to Sebastian. Welcome, Maestra. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And welcome to our Tone Teaches free concert talks. It is uh, my uh, honor and distinct privilege to welcome tonight Tania Leon, a distinguished composer, pianist, conductor, art advocate, and educator. And in the interest of a full uh, disclosure, it is in the latter role that I came to know Tanya, as she was my composition teacher at CUNY some years ago, some 20 years ago, I believe. Uh, Tanya, nice to see you. After oh, I mean, it's a joy to time. be here again. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who, un who are unfamiliar with uh, Tania's uh, impressive biography, here's a few things about her. Tania Leon's compositions have been performed by a variety of orchestras, such as Gewann House Orchestra, Leipzig, Orchestra de la Suisse Romande, NDR Symphony Orchestra from Germany, Symphonic and Lyric Orchestra of Nancy in France, the American Composers Orchestra, New World Symphony, Cincinnati Symphony, China National Symphony and so many others. She has collaborated with people like John Ashbery, Margaret Atwood, um, Jamaica Kincaid, Julie Tamer, among others. Uh, mm -hmm. Among her most recent com commissions are Stride as part of New York Philharmonic's Project 19 in celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment, Anima for Jennifer Coe's Alone Together series in response to the coronavirus pandemic, still going on, and Ser for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Her opera, uh, Scourge of Hyacinthus, has received over 20 performances in Europe, in Mexico. I think it has yet to be, yet to be staged in the US, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was commissioned by Hans Werner Henze in the city of Munich for its fourth uh, Biennale and it won the prestigious BMW Prize for Best New Work of Opera Theatre. She is also much in demand as a guest conductor. She has appeared with, among others, the Philharmonic Orchestra and Chorus of Marseille, Evan Haus Orchestra, Beethoven Halle Orchestra in Germany, Orchestra de la Suisse Romande, Orchestra Sinfonica de las Asturias in Spain, Santa Cecilia Orchestra in Italy, Orchestra Philharmonica de Bogota, Colombia, Orchestra Sinfonica de Cuba, Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra in South Africa and New York Philharmonic as well. Active as an educator, she is currently Professor Emerita of the City University of New York, but she also has lectured at the uh, prestigious uh, Moses Lectures at Humboldt University in Berlin, at Harvard University, University of Chicago. She has been a visiting professor at Yale, Chicago University, University of Michigan, Kansas Purchase College, Musik Hochschule in Hamburg, in Germany, among others. She also served as a um, composer's mentor at the Jazz Composers Orchestra Institute and also was a guest composer and conductor at the Musik Hochschule in Hamburg and the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing, China. Among her many honors, 
are the New York Governor's Lifetime Achievement Award, the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Music, fellowships, awards from the Kusevitsky Music Foundation, Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, Chamber Music America, ASCAP, Meet the Conductor, Symphony Spaces Access to the Arts, and she also has had artists' residencies at Bellagio, City Vela Ranieri, at the McDowell, and the American Academy in Rome in Italy, among so many others. Well, after so many, <laughs> there's so many more things left to still say about your amazing career. Tanya, once again, welcome to Ton. So nice to have you here with us. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> I wanted to begin first, you know, by just discussing a little bit about your uh, your life and your, you know, your music. You've had about, I'll say by now, close to or maybe even more than 50 years as, as a composer. And yet you have managed to avoid any kind of easy labels that have been applied to you know, contemporary music scene, especially in the US over, over these past decades. There's been the serialism, then there's been the new romanticism movement in the 70s, 80s, minimalism, post-minimalism and what have you. So how would you define yourself if, if you know, if you, so much you def defy any categorizations, but how would you de define yourself as a composer and your music in particular? Well, um, I define myself as a musician <laughs> that composes, that conducts, that do all kinds of things, that um, uh, promotes other composers, you know, I mean, because I'm very supportive of uh, the community. And, um, but um, it, 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 it's actually the fact that I got into composition as, uh, as something that happened to me, not because I chose uh, to be in composition, my first inclination was piano because I mean, I study, uh, you know, to become a classical musician, you know, a classical pianist. And that is how I arrived in the United States. And then um, because I actually in a chance encounter met a man that asked me if, I mean, he heard me play and he asked me if I would like to actually collaborate with him, that he had a project in mind and, uh, you know, I mean, the beginning of that project was him imparting a ballet lessons and for me to actually play. And he didn't want me to play with books. He just wanted me to improvise. So that's how the whole thing began. I didn't know that that was going to change my life completely uh, because my plan was to stay in the United States for a couple of years or whichever years that I was required to stay and get uh, the citizenship and then go to France, which was my dream. That's, that's how I left Cuba, thinking that I am going to end up in Paris, studying with Nadia Boulanger and getting my degrees from the, uh, you know, the Paris Conservatoire oh, as a pianist, as a classical pianist. Well, fate uh, made this encounter with somebody that I didn't know who he was. I didn't speak English at the time. And it was uh, basically, you know, intuition on his part. And for me, it, it sounded like magnificent that I was going to be involved in this uh, project that he had in mind. The project ended up becoming the Dance Theater of Harlem. And uh, I found out who he was the day that he gave me a ticket to go to Lincoln Center. And then at Lincoln Center, I saw him on stage. I realized that he was a dancer. And then when I started to investigate it even more, I realized that he was a dancer for which Stravinsky, who was alive, had been reading all the music that he was dancing. So, I mean, so that was such a, an incredible surprise. And then, you know, I mean, working with him, he introduced me to George Balanchine, and then it was Gerald Robbins. I mean, all these incredible uh, choreographers. And, uh, and uh, one day, uh, during a class that I was actually accompanying him, he said, why don't you write a piece and, you know, I do a choreography. And that was the first ballet of Dance Theater of Harlem. And I, uh, when I wrote that piece in 1971, I have not formally studied composition. I did it at intuition in a way. 
I'm picking up a lot of books at the library in terms of theory and you know how to compose and how to put things together. <laughs> and it was not until I saw the performance of that ballet, you know, which by the way, I recorded myself, you know, we went to a studio and I was the pianist. And from the piano, I was actually sort of like directing the other musicians. And um, when I saw that on stage and the lights and the dancers and the audience, and you know, I mean, it was such a, an emotional moment that that is when I made the decision that I went back to NYU where I was validating my degrees from Cuba. And I told them that I wanted to shift my major. And uh, if I could shift from piano to composition. So that's that's the story. And I, I only had one teacher and that teacher was Ursula Mangluck. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, she uh, passed away about six or seven years ago and she was German. And uh, she, you know, I mean, my first encounter with composition was that I had to learn serialism and 12 tongues and you know pointillism i mean everything that was going on at the time in terms of uh, composition it was concerned and uh, something that really i didn't feel that much uh, affinity for but yeah. it was i mean it was the reglament of that time that it was the curriculum for the composers to actually deal with this type of technical writing and 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 discussions of abstract music. And, and uh, the only thing at that time is was that the advent of the electronic music began. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with the, Dr. Gilbert, I remember his name. And uh, uh, I was actually given access to the Bukla synthesizer. So consequently, you know, one of the uh, ballets that I wrote for Dance Theater of Harlem once I was actually studying composition, it was a ballet that included electronics for the first time in my life. So, I mean, that's how this thing happened. I never, I never thought I was going to be a composer, never alone. I mean, a conductor, you know, I mean, the conducting was the same. We went to Italy to the Spoleto Festival, you know, with the company. And there, you know, uh, the director of that as Spoleto Festival was Giancarlo Menotti, you know, the, co the, yes. the, the composer. And uh, I don't know, I mean, he had a meeting with Arthur and they concluded that I would conduct the orchestra. So they turned to me and said, you're gonna conduct the orchestra. I said, I don't know, I mean, I, 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 I'm not gonna conduct her. Are you kidding? I mean, me conducting the orchestra? <laughs> yes, you know all the ballets. I mean, you know everything, <laughs> you know the steps, you know, you know. And they threw me in the pit you know, with the Juilliard Orchestra. And um, it was uh, interesting for me because I found the resources of my upbringing in music in Cuba. I was trained with a French training, you know? And the French training starts with solfege. Mm -hmm. Everything is solfege. Yeah. So therefore, I mean, you solfege, solfege, solfege. And I think that that is one of the things that actually make you sometimes develop into perfect pitch, you know, which I, I have in that case. But the thing is that every time that you had to do a lesson, while you were do doing the lesson, you had to sightseeing and conduct. So if you were reading in 4-4, you have to, you see, right? So, I mean, so I did that while I was growing up as a musician. So what did happen is that, yes, I conducted the orchestra, but I was in my mind, so finding everything that was in front of me. <laughs> so therefore it was very organic what happened. And there were some incredible musicians, you know, which were very young at the time. And uh, among them, it was Ransom Wilson playing the flute, yeah. you know, which I mean, is a stellar flutist nowadays. Yes. So therefore, I mean, that's just how the whole thing began. So by the time I came back, no, the next day of that <laughs> encounter of mine with the orchestra and, and the dancers in front of me and the whole thing. I mean, I don't know, you know, I was ready to die right there, <laughs> but I did it. So the, the next day the press said, 
woman conducts orchestra, you know? And I said, oh my God. <laughs> you know? So when I came back to the States, uh, I went to NYU, I said, I mean, I, I have to enroll in conducting courses. And uh, I did uh, a little bit of that. And I started studying with uh, Lashlo Halash, mm -hmm. uh, which was actually uh, um, a, a, a brilliant and wonderful um, conductor, um, one of the founders of New York City Opera. Yeah. You know, with Jul Julius Brudel. And then, uh, so, I mean, he taught me uh, not only conducting the symphonic or any, any, any kind of uh, ensemble, but he also taught me how to conduct opera, which was very good for me because then I conducted my own opera, you know, right. the one that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I ended up in Tanglewood studying with Maestro Bernstein and Osawa and, and, and the whole troupe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. Quite but among those, you know, I don't want to actually uh, dismiss the fact that I also conducted on Broadway because I was a music director of, of the Broadway show, The Wiz. You remember The, the Wiz? Yes. Uh huh. So I mean, so I mean, so I, I, I go from one genre to another. I mean, and I, I love music. Period. <laughs> yeah. So, to, to, I, I noticed that yeah, given your variety of interests in in music and. Uh, stylistic influences. I mean, I, I see a lot of like, I see in your music and like some, you know, there's the Latin American slash Caribbean influence, then there's the jazz, uh, occasional stylistic, then there's the European tradition. And so among your, you know, say, what kind, what composers have influenced you and what particularly about those composers appeals to you when you're starting? Well, I mean, from the, my very early beginning, I, you know, you have to understand that I arrived here and I didn't know anything in terms of composers. Um, you know, at the conservatory, we study a lot of composers, you know, that have passed away a long time ago. Sure. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things, however, on that training is that we would play the contemporary composers from Cuba was part mm -hmm. of their curriculum, you know, and uh, or even uh, pieces that were um, of composers of the past, yeah. but Cuban composers, they were, you know, giving yeah. us that. But uh, other than that, I didn't have any any interest in contemporary music. I mean, the only thing is that my teacher introduced me to Bartok, talk mm -hmm. because I had to learn the microcosmos. Microcosmos, right. Right? And the thing is that that sort of like, oh, this, this is interesting, <laughs> I mean, that is something that it woke me up, but not to the tune that I would actually pursue that. And uh, by the time I came to the, to, to the United States, the only composers that I knew, it was Bernstein because of a clip of West Side Story that was shown in Cuba on television. And then Aaron Copland, you see, because I mean, the teachers at the school, I mean, at the conservatory talked about Aaron Copland. Hmm. But I didn't no, know Bernstein about- either? No Gershwin or there was no discussion? Well, Gershwin, yes, because I mean, you know, you would hear Rhapsody in Blue, for example. Yeah. You know, but I never heard uh, um, Porgy and Bess and things like that. Not, not that, you know, I mean, really, uh, maybe is that I was not involved in, in pursuing, uh, you know, the, the, the music of living composers at that time. Yeah. Uh, even that by, t by that time Gershwin was gone, but yeah. uh, but um, this whole thing happened here. Uh, and at Dan Theater, once I wrote a piece, then we started bringing composers to write more pieces for the company. So mm -hmm. it, it became, you know, something that captivated my attention. So the film Stravinsky would be among your influences when you're first Experience oh, Stravinsky, of, of course, because I mean, everybody talk about Stravinsky, specifically right. in the conservatory in Cuba, you see. And you were still alive at the time you came to uh, to the States. It, exactly. It, 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 it was like, you know, that's why when I heard that Stravinsky was alive and that he was writing the music for Ortho Mitchell, I flipped out completely. I said, oh my God. Was it Agon, <laughs> was it Agon that he wrote? Agon? Right. And that's the first ballet that I saw Ortho dancing. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it was such a, a cultural shock, you see. And then um, working with, um, with Dan Theater of Harlem, at Dan Theater of Harlem, um, it was such a, an, a, a phenomenal situation, you know, the creation of a company to demonstrate that the people of color could dance ballet, you know, because yes, Arthur yes. was the only one at, at New York City Ballet. And because of the assassination of Martin Luther King, he felt that he needed to do something. And that's what he actually created that project. But um, at that time, you know, I mean, many of the artists of color started coming to dance theater to help and to talk to us, the, the young generation, and about the consciousness of what we were doing. So um, I, I feel now is that, that I understand the honors that I was re recipient of because one of my ballets was narrated by Marian Anderson. Wow. You know, and then, you know, Incredible. I mean, uh, the person that came to help us in terms of, you know, what to do on stage, how to present ourselves and things, that was Cecily Tyson that just- Just recently passed she just, away. Yeah. She just passed. Yeah. But I mean, we had there from, oh my God, uh, uh, Leontine Price and Jesse Norman and, and Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte, all these people. Wow, what an what an array! Talk to of us, and, you know, and uh, it, it it was a parade. I mean, Stevie Wonder. I mean, I remember the day Stevie Wonder came in. I mean, we could hardly do anything but look at him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we did uh, performances that you know. I mean, uh, we went backstage, and there was Michael Jackson, and um, we did things. You know, we met presidents of the United States. Yeah. We went to uh, London and uh, we met the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> that very same Queen <laughs> yes. that we talked about today. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's pictures that we have with the Queen. And um, about two months before she passed away, we did a performance with, with Josephine Baker. Wow. You know? I mean, it, it, it mm. was like... Yes. It is. Uh, uh, and from there, you know, then... I graduated into going into the city and not until 1986 is that I joined CUNY. Mm -hmm. And then you're at CUNY for many years up until quite- 33 recently. years, 33 yeah. years. Yes, I began at CUNY, you know, I mean, I never thought that I was going to be a professor or, you know, so I grew mm -hmm. up with the position from position to position. Yeah. Until, yes, you know, uh, escalated to distinguish because of all of the things that I was doing at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, incredible. Mm -hmm. This is just, yeah, yeah. yeah fascinating. And uh, you mentioned also, we talked about jazz earlier. What was like, what were your like earliest connections with jazz? I would assume it, everything happened in, in, in the US when you arrived, or was there any kind of jazz scene in? Well, in Cuba, if there was a jazz scene, I was not involved, you see. I mean, there, there was always Latin jazz, always, always, because I mean, the Cubans adore jazz, you mm -hmm. see? And the musicians there, you know, for example, one of the musicians that is here that everybody knows about it, I mean, we were all in the, in the same conservatory, you know? I mean, the one that was ahead of us was Leo Brower, of course, Leo Brower. you know? Yeah. But then um, in the conservatory, I mean, was Sandoval, you know, mm -hmm. a trumpet player, right? Yeah. And um, my graduation, you know, we did the graduation together. That was Paquito de Rivera and I. And Paquito uh, was not playing the saxophone. I mean, he graduated playing a clarinet. Hmm. And me at the piano. And we opened with the sonata for, for uh, a clarinet and piano by Brahms. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all classical, you know, we were, just, you know, and now we find ourselves in New York. I mean, he's doing his thing and doing my thing. We have done things together. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it's a very incredible yeah. life. Incredible, Sorry. yeah. Mm -hmm. do you, what is your connection with Cuba these days? Do you go back there much or do you? Well, uh, I know you, right left, now, you left a long time. You left in 67, if I'm not mistaken. 67, right, right, right. right. I mean, you know, um, 
my connection with Cuba is that I still have uh, a nephew there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his family, you know, yeah. his son, which is studying percussion. I was the first musician in my family. And then there's a parade of musicians after me. And <laughs> <laughs> we all, you know, my brother is a jazz pianist and, yeah. you know, working in Europe. And my niece is a, an opera singer, <laughs> you know. And uh, what's going to see no. Yeah, the one that is in Cuba is a sound engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. And, uh, so, I mean, and Cuba invited me in uh, 2016 to go and conduct the symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I went and I uh, included one of my pieces. Was it the first time your music was performed in Cuba in 2016? No, you know that my piece, uh, my music was introduced to Cuba uh, one of the first people that played there was Ursula Opens. Oh, the pianist, yes. The pianist, and she called mm -hmm. me and she told me I went to Cuba and it so happened that she was going to be there the week of Mother's Day. So what I did is I wrote a piece called Mystica and I said, could you play this piece? She said, okay, she said, yeah, but she was telling me I'm going in, you know, I would like to play something of yours. So I wrote that piece and uh, my mother was in the audience and when she oh. finished playing the piece, the piece was dedicated to my mother. My mother didn't know anything. This was a plot between <laughs> Ursula and I. So uh, when she finished uh, uh, playing the piece, she talked to the audience, said the piece was dedicated to my mother and she took the score and she gave my mother the score in front of everybody, which was already dedicated by me. Yes. <laughs> my mother was just like in shock that this was happening because the only thing that I told her, go to that concert. I mean, she's going to play a piece of mine. I want you to hear it. <laughs> you know? Wow, that's just <laughs> beautiful. Yes. And um, coming, to, uh, coming to the States, the music, I mean, the music, or you've described some of the music scene that was there was just uh, around, around the dance theater of Harlem. And mm -hmm. overall, were you exposed to the wider musical scene as well? Uh, like the downtown scene, for example, John Cage, Feldman. I didn't know anything about downtown, uptown, midtown. Yeah. I was always out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I was an out of town. I didn't want to be any, in any group, but yeah. I met them all, you know, and I had a wonderful, wonderful friendship with, uh, with John Cage. You know, in fact, uh, we went in a conference in the Tellurites Mm -hmm. And uh, he went out to um, to pick up mushrooms, and uh, you know, I mean, because he knew everything. Like that was his big, yeah, yeah. passion. And yeah. I went with him. I went with him, and we pick up the mushrooms. And then when we back to the house, you know, where all the composers were staying, he said, "Well, I am going to do the dinner tonight." And Polina Liberos <laughs> and I said, "I said, oh my God, are we going to be alive tomorrow?" <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was scared, <laughs> but he knew exactly. Well, I'm talking to you. I mean, right. <laughs> <he> didn't die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but this, this, this composers, you know, I mean, real people, everybody. Mm -hmm. you know. Was that a conscious decision on your part to kind of avoid uh, being associated with certain trends or currents? No, uh, no, I was always. Uh, as I said, an out of town person, because mm -hmm. I found everything very interesting. I mean, it's a lot of new music for me, mm -hmm. new trends. I mean, you know, I loved, uh, I loved the propositions of, of John Cage and Alban Zulusier. And mm -hmm. I was, you know, because I, I mentioned that uh, because uh, they all passed, but yeah. uh, I, 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 I was crazy about Colonel Nankaro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And very, of course, very percussive, kind of very percussive music. And was he any, would you say that, was he in any time or any influence on your music? The rhythm is almost such a big, important part of your music, rhythm, rhythmic textures and. Yeah, well, but the thing is that it's part of the culture. Yeah. All of Latin America has a lot of rhythms, you know, I mean, right. and, uh, and the advent of the Africanos plus the Amerindians that were there, I mean, there's a, such a hybrid and, and such a vibrant, the vibrancy yeah. of, a, of, of, of a rhythmical speech in a way. Plus, uh, most of all these cultures, everybody dances. 
you know, that's the only thing that I miss here. I don't dance as much as I would like to. <laughs> you know? Especially these days. The well, I mean, forget it. No, you can always try and dance with a broom if you wanted yeah. to. But but the thing is that I uh, I miss that because I mean, you know, at least in Cuba, if you want to dance, you don't have to go to a dance floor or a, or a bar or anything like that. Uh uh No, 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 no. You get you to go with your family or your friends. Everybody moves the furniture in the living room. <laughs> you know? It turns into a dance floor. And everybody starts dancing. And there is no problem. I mean, the, the old and the, and the young and everybody dancing together. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's something that everybody that goes to uh, the islands, I mean, they come back uh, saying how, how much they sort of like uh, let themselves down and, and express themselves. And, yeah. And if you go to Cuba, that's what you do, yeah. you dance. You dance, unless you end up, you know, I mean, dancing more because you had a mojito. But, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it's part of what you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the uh, Afro, Afro Cuban, the dancing uh, part aspect of music in general and your music. You've always avoided labels such as Afro-Cuban, such as yeah, because I mean, black composer, people, female composer. No, let me explain to you the thing is the contribution of the Africanos in, uh, to the music of the Americas have been absolutely incredible, Enormous. Yeah. right? I mean, including the United States. But the thing is that um, to label Cuban music as just Afro-Cuban is what I tell people, okay, if the Cuban music is Afro Cuba, what is the other? There's no other type of music in Cuba, you see? <laughs> and the thing is that the, the music of Cuba is a hybrid, a hybrid of the different communities of, of humans that came to the island, you know, starting with traces of the Amerindians, which are the Indians that were there before Christopher Columbus, right. you know, they attribute that some of the what we call the clave. They used to play with sticks that yep. they would have something called, you know, whatever it was called, you know, that it, it was a gourd with, with, with bits inside, you know, reminiscent of the maracas, you know? Yep. I mean, so they had instruments, they have their own thing going on. Okay, after that, the Spanish people came in and the Spanish people is already a hybrid because the Spanish had the Moors in Spain for many years, you see? And that's why when you hear the, the cantejondo, I love, you know, I mean? you know mm -hmm. it reminds you of the cantors of Israel, or it reminds you of the Arabian singing, you know, I mean, so you, you start hearing all these melange mm -hmm. of influences in the music of the different regions of the world. So the Spaniards coming after the Spaniards, the Africanos, and the Africanos came with the drums. And that was a spectacular because polyrhythmia came in. Mm -hmm. See? And yeah. then after that, you have other migrations. The Asian migration in Cuba mm -hmm. was very instrumental too. Besides that, the Africana and the Asian, you know, use pentatonics, you know? Yeah. Uh, 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 in other words, I, I don't even call it pentatonic scale because I mean, pentatonic means it's five pitches, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But but that is very cemented into their music. Then you had not only that, but then you had the migrations coming from, from Haiti. Every time that there was a revolution in Haiti, the Haitians would run to Cuba in boats. I mean, yeah. you know. And the thing is that they were bringing the French, you see? So yeah. when you hear, there's a lot of piano pieces that you might not know of, of a composer called Amadeo Roldan, for example, mm -hmm. yes. which are salon pieces, yeah. very French in a way, you see? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Cuba has many, many genres of music, but it's, it's what happened there is the, 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 the hibernation of all of these different cultures. And what, for example, we have something called the Wawanko, and the Wawanko has a cushion of drumming, right? With a tremendous polyrhythmia, right? And on top, you have this type of singing that resembles the singing of the Spaniards. Yeah. You see? So therefore, you have two cultures there, you know, setting precedence and merging. 
And that is something that we never discuss. We usually say, oh, la, uh, la, la, Música mexicana. <laughs> you know, but I mean, we have to understand how was that form and why that sound is like that. And it's indigenous of the people that created that culture. And the cultures are constantly changing. That's why when people tell me, what is your identity? I say, well, I'm still working on it. <laughs> because I mean, my identity is transforming. Nowadays, I go to Cuba and they don't recognize I'm Cuban. Yeah. Because I have gestures now imported into my, my beingness as a New Yorker. Yeah. Which is not the gestures of people from California. Mm -hmm. Which is very different. Or, or the accents of, of the South versus, versus the North. Yes. You see? So in other words, I mean, it's, it's a replica of what happens all over the world anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why, that's why you've always been resistant to labels and that other applies to your stylistic, the stylistic approach. No, I, and, uh, I mean, labels of any kind. kind of approach to composition. Uh, no, but not, no, no, not only uh, a label, you know, now that there's so much discussion about society and, and human beings and things like that, I even, even don't like racial labels. Yes. Because I mean, for me, we are a species in a planet. We are the human species in right. this planet that we don't even know where we are in the middle of the universe. You see? Yes. And the thing is that it, it's like if you're going to talk about canine species, you know, in that species, you talk about the Chihuahua, the, the Maltese, the Pequines, the <laughs> Labrador, the German Shepherd, you know what I mean? And we make such a fuss. Right. Because a skin color, because the culture, because what language you speak, how tall you are, how thin or how, how heavy you are. I mean, you know, it's always something. You see? Yeah. So therefore, I mean, through that process, one, one, one of the things that we have been live, I mean, losing through centuries is our humanity. Yeah. Because I mean, then we, we, then we describe the other person as the other. The other, right? right. As opposed to talking about the- Very alienating. And exactly. And, and the issues, it's usually issues of power. That's it. As power, well. politics, geopolitics. Exactly, right. Coming from Eastern Europe, I know quite- <laughs> so, <laughs> so, things, so, Boundaries and-, and, and, and Wherever you go, there's somebody always fighting somebody, you know, why, why is she? Using the, the that skirt is too slow. It's too it's too low. The other one, is too, you know, the other one with the hair. The other one, who's living with who? I mean, it's like too much. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know. In many ways, I think that for for you particularly, with your uh, with your roots coming from Spain, from France, China, from uh, Africa, like you're quite the embodiment of this what we call the global. Well, you know, I think that um, something that contributed to my thinking was my family, which was comprised of people of three different races, you know, and, uh, and that was not a discussion at home. You know, I was the grand granddaughter of my grandfather and, you know, everybody looked different. I mean, and to this day, every time that somebody is born, we look up, how does it look like? <laughs> <laughs> Was it like grandpa, grandfather, or grandfather? you know what I mean? But now, I mean, but but we have such a concern about, for example, pigmentation. You know, I mean, that the skin is the best. I mean, one of the best organs in the human body because it protects the entire body, mm -hmm. see, regardless of what is the tone of the skin. It says it it, it serves the same purpose. You yeah. see. And why do I have to actually criticize that another person has, you know, and, and that have been an excuse that have fostered abuse of one group against the other. Absolutely. So that's that's my, my opinion, my very mm -hmm. humble opinion. Yeah. yeah. But, and but, the music in so many ways reflects that kind of, you know, merging of various cultures and influence, as we mentioned, right, the, you know, the European tradi classical tradition, the uh, Cuban, the Af African Cuban influences and so on. And I, we have, I think we have a little clip that we could play from your music that I think kind of exemplifies this. I think uh -huh. it's from the, from the Intempo uh, uh, 
so, uh, I think it's like from an album that uh, I think combines uh, like, tracks from various works of yours, Haiku and... Ah, Haiku uh, and... and you know? Yeah, so I think, Victor, if you don't mind playing that um, track in motion, right? Uh. There in the water color of the water moves translucent fishes.
thank you so much, Victor. Thank you for that. Well, <laughs> this was, I think, was a great, great example. I love that haiku uh, little section there. I would really want oh, to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just two different ballets. One is it's a Brazilian influence, and the other one is Japanese influence. Japanese influence. It's just like yeah. you just both com you, you convey them so naturally. So, you know, you've really you know personalized this you know this, this okay. style. It's just it's really wonderful. Speaking of your music, now we can move maybe to move on to the piece that we are going to be performing uh, this Saturday. And it's called Akana. Would you mind talking a little bit about its uh, origins and how it came to be conceived, first of all? Well, um, you know, I was inspired because I didn't know that much about Akanas. And Akana is the name of a tree that uh, grows um, in Latin America and uh, uh, a lot of them in Cuba. And um, in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, I mean, there was a lot of construction based on, on the uses of this wood, which apparently is very strong. And uh, it, it, you know, you build a house with Akana and it lasts forever, you see. Yeah. So that uh, to the point that then I went to uh, Wikipedia <laughs> and, and to the different sources that could show me how the tree would look like. And uh, this was a commission for uh, the uh, Orpheo in, in New York. And um, the orchestra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And um, I, I just uh, was fascinated about that, that, um, that source of information that I didn't know anything about it. I don't know how I bumped into, into the word. And, and I saw Akana and said, what is Akana? And then I found out what it was. And uh, I wanted to actually, um, since it's, it's, it's a wood or a tree that is ancient in a way, you know, indigenous of, of this part of the Americas, you know, I mean, it, this is another thing. I mean, you know, when I was growing up as a child in, in the El Colegio, I mean, which it means, you know, the school yeah. Yeah, in, in, in Cuba, uh, we learn about North America, Central America, and South America, you see. And these Akana is, uh, I don't know if, if the States, there are so many Akanas, but there's a lot of Akanas in Central, the Caribbean and, and South America. And then I uh, sort of sort of like, I mean, for me, where they were like, like heralding um, um, that, that strength that because uh, if you look at the at the picture, it doesn't tell you that it's such a strong tree. <laughs> it looked like a tree, but ah, uh, you know, uh, and that's that's why for me, you know, I use the trumpets, you know, like yeah. heralding that strength. However, is a long tunnel. The very opening of the piece, right? You're talking about those two trumpets. Yes, and the closing as well. You and know, and, and 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 because it's it's like like the tree that have been there forever and 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 the strength is going to be forever <laughs> and every, everything is forever and that's why you know the trumpets in a way at the end they extend themselves you see yeah and then there's another tree over there you know i mean right. so, you know what we have a clip that we can show from the uh, from the actual rehearsal, one of our filmed rehearsals, so we can maybe show now with actually oh, oh, illu oh. illustrating this exact uh, starting uh -huh. point with a with a trumpet. Yeah, I think the idea here. <laughs> just and also, I love that the second trumpet was a, a female trumpet. Oh yeah, yeah, we. Had, <laughs> we <laughs> that was fantastic. No barriers in tone here. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> actually, I think she, I believe she's from China. Our second trumpeter. 
Really? Yes. Ah, that's very good. I love it too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you have having representations. Oh the, yeah, and speaking the, of females, we have our bassoon, or we have a member of Ton here with us, Cheryl Fries, who is actually who wrote the concert notes on your piece. Oh, and thank you, I'm very much. A little bit. And I'm gonna keep them. I'm gonna give them to my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> you them with the score, the publisher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so actually, I also spent a lot of time researching what the tree Akana was. Oh, you did? Like you did. <laughs> um, that it's was the first Akana. thing I did. Uh -huh. The accent is on the first L, Akana. Akana, OK. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and yeah, I also went on Wikipedia to figure out what it was. But it was a really interesting experience for me personally, because I wrote the concert notes before we had our first rehearsal. Uh -huh. So when we sat down, it was like everything was coming to life and was making sense from what I was writing when I was researching this. But um, this has been a really incredible experience for us as an orchestra because it's actually our first time for the winds coming back and playing together. And we obviously have limitations. We're six feet apart from each other, which makes such a difference. We have masks on and bell covers, but um, it's been really exciting to especially play this piece because of all of the different musicians who've been featured, like the trumpets and the opening in the end, the bass clarinet, um, the percussionists who are doing like double duty back there. And really it's like a percussion concerto sometimes. It's incredible. Um, and I've noticed for this piece on the program, all of the musicians, everyone has had to be very committed to playing expressively and confidently and paying attention to what's written in their own individual part to really bring out um, the life in the piece. And I think it's expanded everybody's horizons for expression because of that. And um, we've also, because of the spacing, it's interesting because you would think it'd be so challenging to be so far apart from each other. But I think with this piece, it's so atmospheric. It's kind of incredible to just hear things coming from all around you at once and has also just heightened all of us listening to each other, um, which is, also a unique experience since this is the first time we're playing together. So we're really getting to know each other through this. So yeah, we've all worked really hard to highlight the energy and the liveliness and also the serenity that I've found in the piece and just incredibly beautiful moments in this piece. Um, so I'm really we looking forward. Tracks that we can actually show if you'd like from this, uh, from this, I think that captures some of that, you know, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, interest that our you know players have in this maybe a uh, victor we're gonna play the next track <laughs> Nice. And I think we have one more, I think that shows a bit more kind of the next section, the more lyrical uh, uh, contrasting sort of idea in the piece. Maybe Victor, you know, play next, number five. Yeah, that's the one. I love this section here. It's just such yeah. a beautiful moment. I, I, I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Cheryl, you want to add something else? Do you have something more that you need to say? Um, 
No, I was going to say that I'm just really, well, I mean, hearing that clip was also interesting because I haven't heard what it sounds like coming out, but no, it's been a joy for all of us to work on this and I'm really excited to mm -hmm. it airing on Saturday. Thank you, thank you. You know, I uh, was telling Sebastian before that, um, you know, there's a section that has to do with the wood wings, you know, and uh, that section is sort of like the forest, you see, it's surrounded by the forest and, and, and and uh, the vignettes with the solos is, is like, a, I don't know. I mean, sometimes when you zero into one spot and then you discover one thing and then you zero into the other spot and you, you know, I, I love nature and, and right now the spring is coming back and uh, right there and, and the front of, of uh, where I live, there's a tree and uh, I am checking him out. <laughs> you know, or her out. I mean, you know, why? Because the bots start coming in and the bots are not too defined yet. But as soon as I see them all defined, and this is a ritual that I do every year, I go and I embrace the tree. I, I give it a hug because oh. it's coming back, you know, I mean, and it's mm -hmm. so, it's so moving, you know, to hug a tree is, is just unbelievable. So the I think world, that- The world would be better if we all, if everyone did that. At least one. Oh, oh, oh. But I mean, you know, because I mean, during the winter, I see all that snow. I see, oh my God, what's happening? You know what I mean? Okay, you're having water in the roots and everything. And then spring comes in and you start seeing these little bumps coming in, the, you know? And I said, wow, you're black. And I go and I give him a ring every, every year, you know? I mean, if I move from here, I'm going to miss that one. <laughs> yeah. Wow! Yeah. Thank you so much for this. I I think I I think we are I, I I think we have spoken enough, at least on my side here as well. Maybe I'd like to op open the floor to any to everyone now to ask questions. Okay. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I think Nicole is uh, the yeah, one. Yeah, see is. Nicole de Jesus in there. Hi, <laughs> hi, Tanya. It's hi. So how are you doing? I'm well. It's so nice to see you again um, after so many years. Like Sebastian, I have not seen you I in, know. in ages. So oh it's God. just, it's so wonderful to have you with us. Um, we're so excited to have you, um, to have be, be performing your piece. Thank and you. you used the word herald before. Yeah. Um, we we're kind of heralding, you know, the return <laughs> of woodwinds and brass playing with the strings and, and everybody together again. So I know, I know. It's a reopening, I think. Very Rejuvenation. Nice. So anyway, <laughs> but we have a couple questions so far. So Leonardo, uh -huh. I'm going to take the first one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tanya, as a composer, how do you get your inspiration for the pieces you write? Is it combining several sounds from different composers or is there something more? Well, I hope it's something more. Uh, and again, I was talking the ritual of my, my going and, and giving a hug to the tree because it's coming back. Um, I have certain rituals, you know, that uh, I don't know why, but I have to do that uh, before, uh, as I am gathering my ideas and and I create a lot of sketches in different pages, in different papers, um, because I could be at, 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 at the supermarket and all of a sudden an idea came in and I just, I just jog it down and I might have 50 sketches, as you know, sometimes about a piece because I am involved in thinking about the piece. But the ritual is that the most intrig intriguing for me is that I have to order something in the house. It could be the chest of drawers where I have all my brass, you know? So I have to get all the brass and put them in the same color <laughs> together and everything. Or it might be uh, where, where I have the linen or the towels. And, and then I have to actually put it apart and then put it together again. I mean, it's like organizing my mind. I don't understand what it is, but that is something that I notice that I have to do or put something together and, and that is sort of like, it prepares me for, 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 for what I am gonna create. I like to create 
And for each piece, a different environment. In other words, I, uh, I might construct between eight and 10 uh, chords of my own design, you see? And I utilize that as it was a series of, it, it's, a, it's a long, it's, it's like the same thing that we talked about the octet, um, you know, in, in the octatonic scale in, in Stravinsky, you know, I might have about 10, 12 chords, you know, which actually for me, that is the environment that piece is gonna have. Trying to get each piece, creating for each piece a, 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 a different paradigm, you see. And then out of that, I don't, you know, I might be influenced by many, 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 many composers because that's exactly what I did. You know, when I finished studying with Ursula Mamlock, I didn't study with any other teacher. However, because I study with all the best teachers in the world, uh, meaning that I am very um, fond of looking at scores that are in, interesting to me from people, from, from composers from all over the world, you know? I mean, I look at notations, I mean, and, and this is something that perhaps Sebastian should remember that we talked about this, you know? I, I, I write, you know, I mean, pencil and paper. I don't write on the computer because I feel that the computer steals my, my brain, <laughs> you know? I wanna control the computer. I don't want the computer, the computer controlling me, you see? And uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, I think that my compositional uh, process has to do with integration and the intellectual, with the instinctual, with the heart. I have to feel the piece. Otherwise, you know, I mean, there's a lot of pieces that I have thrown in the garbage because I said, no, no, this, this, this is not it, you know? Or, or portions of the piece that I said, no, 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 please, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I talk to myself sometimes and, uh, Another thing is that when I finish a piece, I don't touch it anymore. I don't go back to revamp or redo or no, 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 no. That was that moment. That was that piece. So, I mean, it's, it's like having a baby. You have a baby and then after, you know, what, what, you don't like the color of the hair. So, I mean, you start, you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I mean, you have to accept it's your baby. This is my baby this way, you know? And that, that is the way I treat all, all the pieces that I write. And, uh, and it's interesting because, I mean, it's, it's like each of them are, are each, each, of, each piece is a part of a, a, a creator, you know, whether it's actually a book or, or a, a poem or a piece of music or a piece of art, you know. And uh, another thing that inspires me is not only other composers, it's like I adore Ligeti, for example. And the, the, the life that I had with Hans Werner Hensel, which was practically one of my backers, one of them, somebody that believed in me, you know, uh, it's, it's I, I, I miss him tremendously, tremendously, you know, because I mean, we became friends you know, and uh, now um, I still, you know, I, I have a friendship with Andreessen, you know, a lot of people, you know, and it's like my friendship with John Tower, you know, <laughs> I might not be a bard, but John Tower, I mean, when did we talk? Four days ago, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and sometimes we spend hours on the phone and, and we, we laugh about when we met each other and we have written pieces dedicated to each other, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 that, that is where it, it, it is for me in terms of composition. And uh, it's like Ligeti, oh my God. He gave me the opportunity to write a piece for the NDR, the piece called Horizons. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the, the vanity of, of talking about these people, but these people were people. They were human beings. It's not the pedestal that we create, you know I mean? And this is what I feel every time we talk about Beethoven, oh my God, Beethoven. The thing is that Beethoven was a musician like any of us, 
you know, and he was gigging. I mean, I mean, he has a string quartet. He was a violist. He was trying to get jobs here and there, and uh, and so we glorify all these people because we like their music and everything. But we make such a myth out of everybody, you know, and uh, and and there are other sources that I really, really uh, inform me, and I am very enamored of. It's like a, you know, I I adore Michelangelo, you know. And reading and, and trying to figure out how he came up of, of the composites that he did, for example, to, to create La Pieta, you know, out of a piece of marble. Because I've seen it and I still can't comprehend how he did that. <laughs> you know, he had no computer at that time and the tools were very unsophisticated. And look what he did, you know. And, uh, and th those are the things that inspire me a great deal and, and talking about the potential that we all have and, and the sanctity of a human being. Because I mean, each human being are perfect machines, you see? And uh, it's something that sometimes we don't know, don't know how to appreciate, mm. you know? And that's why for me, yeah, yeah. It's not, it doesn't matter. You know, I can go to China and enjoy myself the same way that I go to Brazil and, <laughs> and enjoy myself. Because as I said, it's the same planet. I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> you know, it's just visiting different neighborhoods. That's it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, that, that was a question from, from a student from the Classical Music Institute, Haciel Valera in San Antonio, Texas. And I have another student from, from San Antonio, Texas, from the Classical Music Institute that says, when you compose and you write for instruments you don't play physically, what is your thought process? I'm curious as to how you can bring out the best in every instrument. Well, I mean, it's a process of actually dealing with the real musician also, you know? If you don't know that much about strings and you don't actually, uh, study very, very profoundly the, the, the book by Sam Adler, for example, an orchestration that comes with all kinds of examples and it tells you about the register of the instrument, you know, what is the best acoustic moment on that instrument or portion of the instrument that, that, that you can actually work with. I mean, what is the tessitura of the instrument? I mean, the lowest and the highest, and what do you want to do with the instrument besides playing the instrument now that we have so many extended techniques, you know, that people are using specifically in noise music, you know, the party from Lachenman, for example, you know, then you learn all of that. And specifically, if you're going to write for an instrument that you don't know, you have to, at least in my case, is try to know as much as you can about the instrument. It's like from playing the guitar and you've never get the guitar to, uh, you know, you have never um, played the guitar. So grab a guitar, grab a guitar and, 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 and see well, if it is a six string guitar, you know, uh, you know, you have to, you, you have to understand, you know, why is the movement this way in order to be able to make a chord? In, in, in order to uh, understand the threats, understand the sound of that specific uh, soloist or, or, or musician, and what is actually the sound of one violin versus 20 violin to together playing the same, the same notes. Or, I mean, it, it, that, that is what actually makes you uh, write uh, to, uh, with a, with, write for the instrument with much more confidence. You know, you don't necessarily have to uh, write um, the, for, for the instrument that you play. It's like, you know, I mean, one of the most scary for, the things for me was to write for harp. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> the harp and the pedals and trying to understand what was going on every time that there's a change and how you're going to actually uh, put in the score to, to be, to, to indicate, you know, the changes a, a ahead of time. And uh, yet you talk to a harpist and for them it's like drinking a glass of water. <laughs> they, they will explain it to you and really get you into the world of, of that instrument. And um, 
little by little, you know, you end up writing for 20 instruments, 30 instruments that you really feel comfortable with. That's how I've done it, you know what I mean? Because I only play about four instruments, but, but no, no more. No, uh, not only four. I think four is a tremendous amount. Um, <laughs> what's in me? Um, here is a question, um, and it's very specific to Bard and to Bard alums like myself and my colleague, Reza. Um, did we hear correctly that you collaborated with the poet John Ashbery? Yes. He, cause, because he taught at Bard for years, and we want to know what the collaboration was. Well, it's a piece called, I believe, um, it, it was written for WNYC. It's for Baritone and Marimba. I will have to go to my catalog. I, I don't remember the name right now. Uh, or no, it's called Or Like It. Okay? <laughs> it's Or Like It. Yes, and it was uh, for a marathon of, of pieces, you know, uh, produced by WNYC. And in that very same marathon, Joan also wrote a piece. Yes, so that's a piece that I did with him. But I have worked with, with uh, several poets because I love poetry. I thought I was gonna be a poet when I was in my teens and I wrote a lot of poetry then. And I think that that's the reason why I gravitate to poets. And um, one collaboration that I have also that is very dear to me is collaborating with Rita Dove, you know, with Rita Dove or, or you know, I mean, Margaret Atwood and uh, Jamaica Kincaid and all these people, you know, I mean, poets are just, it's a breed that I love. <laughs> Amazing. We have another question from Anna Vasquez and she says, I was wondering how do you like to implement instruments or music styles from your Cuban heritage? Well, I use them. The only thing that sometimes I use them in ways that people wouldn't do that. For example, um, sometimes when I write for percussion, I mix a lot of, uh, not only uh, Cuba has the Latin American um, parade of instruments, you know, it's not indicative of only Cuban, you know, because I mean, for example, in Maracas, I mean, the specialists of Maraqueros, I mean, and are in Colombia and Venezuela. Those are just unbelievable Maraqueros. If you never have heard a soloist, of, of playing the maracas from those in those uh, um, cultures. I mean, you haven't heard anything, you know? And uh, Cuba is very big in congas. Congas, quinto, you know, I mean, it has a lot of um, demarcation of congas. And, and if you see a conguero, usually surrounded by about four, you know, or five or six drums with the skin. And that's why when the when the conguero is playing, you can see all these display, you know, moving from and and the congas also are tuned in different pitches, so you start hearing music also when that is being played. And uh, in Cuba, there is also a big tradition of bata drums that were brought there by uh, the Africanos, uh, specifically the, from the west coast of uh, Africa. Uh, at the time, it was the Belgian Congo, and uh, which nowadays is Nigeria. And, um, you know, those are three membranes, you know, drums that with two heads, you know. So in other words, I mean, there's one here, one here. So the Ita, the Akonkolo, and the Iya. Those are the, the name of those instruments. And uh, what I was saying is that sometimes when I put a, a group of percussion together, I might mix bongos with a dumbek, with a tabla, with a djembe. So those are four different traditional instruments of four different cultures. And the sound that you get is just spectacular. Because every, each of them has a different voice with a different attack. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 
Here's a question from Amparo. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Tanya, you mentioned that you had to write using serialism while you were at NYU. Did you remove those systems from your compositions once you were free from academic training? I use everything. <laughs> I think that there is still part in whatever way I do, you know, when I actually go into uh, mm, uh, very abstract um, application of, of European theories, you see? It's like, uh, that was a trend of that time. The same way that there was a trend in the 1960s that had to do with what we call nowadays chan music, chance music and aleatoric music, you see. And at that time, that, there was that big revolution that was happening in the approach of, of that kind of music versus America versus the, the European. And it had to do, you know, with a way to approach improvisation in a way that would be much more academical than the improvisation going on in the streets of the world, you see. So that is something, but uh, what I didn't like at that time of a 12 tone uh, type of um, approach is that it became for me, I mean, something like it was much more mathematical and much more. Um, it, it was challenging, it was interesting, you see, but it was a language, you see. For me, languages are not only the language that you and I are spoken, uh, speaking, but uh, the thing is that Schomburg created that language. It's the same thing that, and then followers. And then it became something that it was global in the world of academia. And that is how we go from one trend to other trend. It's like when Terry Riley and Philip Glass and uh, Steve Reich and John Adams, and it says, uh, minimalism, you know? And then you get a parade of people that follow minimalism, you see? And, uh, and that is actually what has happened in my estimation and my humble opinion in academia that we get into these trends that everybody jumps in there in order to be accepted, you see? And that is something that I understood that I had to do that, even that I was not so moved about it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I did it and it was, it was challenging and it was very interesting. Out of that era, what I liked the best was pointillism, you see, which I still use. Because I mean, if you see my piano pieces and everything there all over the place, you jump from here to here, you know, I like that. Uh, I know your piece Momentum for solo piano, right? That one has a lot of like octave displacements and it's, it's exactly. still good, right? yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, it's a technique that I use and all techniques are good. But the thing is that for you to construct your voice, you have to use what you want to use, you see. And who saved me, which I always have to give, him all the um, the uh, the credit of the world is my father, because when I saw my father after not seeing him for twelve years, and I brought my music and uh, everybody heard my music and everything before I was leaving, he said, "Your music sounds very interesting, but where are you in your music?" You know, and uh, I didn't know what he meant at all, at all. Oh my God, it was horrible. And uh, months after he dropped dead. I mean, so we never had to, the chance to discuss what he meant, you see? And that is something that really blew me away. I was so distraught, you know? I mean, you know, cause I mean, that was about the last conversation with him. And that is when I, actually started to actually uh, try to translate what he meant that I was not in my music. And that is when I started to explore. And the first gesture was a piece uh, called Four Pieces for Cello, in which in the, after uh, the second movement, which is a lento doloroso dedicated to him like a, like a prayer, uh, then, the third movement is dedicated 
to him in a different aspect. And is that I started to remember his tumbao. A tumbao in, in, in Latin America is, is, is the way that you walk, the rhythm of your walk, you see? So if somebody uh, walks pretty, you say, oh, wow, what a tumbao, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I started remembering that because I remember, you know, the last time that we were together, I saw him, you know, I mean, he forgot his glasses in one place and he went to pick them up. He said, don't, don't come with me, and I'll, I'll pick it up. And then I saw him walking on the back and I say, wow, look at my father's tumbao. So that is called tumbao. And uh, in that, in that, movement, I started using some fragments of ideas that had to do with the clave, the Cuban clave, that had to do with a, a specific pattern. And um, I turned the cello into a, into a drum, for example, in the middle of the whole thing, it was playing there, boom, bam, you know, and then all kind of things, you know, and that is the first piece that all of a sudden everybody started saying, oh my God, you know? And uh, everybody started playing the piece. And uh, so I started to discover uh, roots of, 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 of influences that I knew very well, but I had never included into my, my writing because since my writing was classical, uh, Academical, I would never would uh, have done that without his intervention, in a way. And it was tremendous because I mean I always say that it's his legacy to me or he, the inheritance that he left me with, because uh, you know I mean, just like now I mean I I, I lost uh, a half brother uh, to COVID in February in Cuba, and uh, we couldn't go. So at that time, because of political reasons between the countries, I couldn't go to my father's funeral either. So therefore, I mean, so that's why that, that was such a, a tremendous uh, impact that he would tell me, where are you in your music, <laughs> you know? And now I'm in my music, everybody's telling me. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic because yes. there, is a, there is a question from another student, Angela Hernandez. Uh -huh. uh, and she asked, what is, you, what is the piece that you have written that has made the biggest impact in, in your life? All of them. I mean, I told you, I mean, those are my children. And I, I don't put one on top of the other, you know. Uh, one of the things is that also uh, there are some people that sometimes inspire you to do something. And uh, the one that commissioned me my opera was Hans. And when he told me, I wanted to write an opera, I said, you kidding, I don't like opera. I told him that. <laughs> I don't see myself writing an opera. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> he said, I think that you can write an opera. <laughs> I thought that he, he was gonna say, well, write something else or, or you know, but uh, no. And I wrote the, the, the opera and he was my coach and he made me write the, the libretto. And he made me write the libretto five times. And we had big fights on the phone, you know, I mean, New York, Rome, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was crazy. But uh, the opera exists, thanks to him. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we have the last question is by Lucy. Um, what do you expect from performers? And what do you feel is the responsibility of performers when they work on your music? Oh my God, Lucy, let me say this. <laughs> uh, I've been surprised by performers because I mean, we conceive something and we think it a certain way, but the performer is the interpreter. And that's the reason why we have thousands and thousands of recordings of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony because each conductor is a different interpretation. Same thing happens with the soloist. At least for us, I mean, I am very humble and very, 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 very um, grateful 
of those that play my music because I know that they work on it. They put hours in actually getting a piece together to be presented to a public that performers get very, 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 very nervous when they know that the composer is in the audience, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be because it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration and uh, we're grateful. I, at least I'm grateful. And I have heard interpretations of my pieces that are so different from each other. And it's like, oh my God, listen to that. You know, it, it, it is fantastic. And, uh, and that is what we do. I mean, we contribute to each other. We create the music, you play the music, you know I mean? It's a, it's a really symbiotic uh, relationship, I think. So um, if you happen to be a, a composer or a performer, um, take that in consideration. That is a collaboration, you know? And that uh, if uh, somebody learn your music and is going to represent your music elsewhere, uh, we should be grateful that that person is doing that. And specifically nowadays, because of contemporary music, there is so much debate is if it's gonna die or it's gonna resuscitate. And I think that as long as we are alive in this planet, things will continue evolving. Nothing is gonna disappear. <laughs> and if it disappears, it's because something spectacular emerge out of all of that. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. Maestra, I want, I want to thank you for, for this amazing time. And I speak on behalf of, of all my college, of, of the students performing on the 10th. I also want to thank all the panelists, Sebastian, for, for leading this conversation, Sheridan, Nicole, Victor. Um, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for, for, for participating, for being here. And I want to invite you again for the 10th. We're going to be... Um, in the chat if if you come you know in the youtube channel when you're watching the streaming please type we're we're all going to be there the the orchestra now team to continue the conversation um so yeah thank you very much maestra tania leon it's, thank, it's you. Been a pleasure. thank you so much tania it was it's been a pleasure talking yeah. to you and reconnecting with you after all these yeah, years. i know yes. yeah 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 there's a lot of people there that i love and, um, you know, I mean, not only Joe, but uh, uh, Upshaw is there. I mean, and, and Don have, you know, recorded one of my arias of that opera mm -hmm. that we were talking about. And then, what is the professor? Uh, uh, she is, I think, in the jazz department, plays the saxophone. Female. She said, yeah. I don't recall her name right now, but uh, but she's also, you know, I mean, somebody that I am close to. Uh, sorry, I don't remember the name right now. But, uh, no, no problem. No problem. Yeah, Tanya, yeah. you need to come and visit when it's safe to do so. Oh, and yes. And hopefully we can all share a mojito with you. Maybe we can uh, dance. <laughs> But so we can all reconnect. And I, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of the other questions, but as Leonardo said, join us for the concert on Saturday. Type it in and maybe we'll be we can get to some more of your questions. And okay. All right. We, we look forward to um working with you again, Tanya. And thank you so much. So good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank all right. Tanya. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank you, Leo. Thank, thank you. Bye everybody. Yeah, yeah. Good night. Bye. <laughs> good night. <laughs>